All right, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 6. We are continuing through those, uh, those seven seals that, that we saw. And as we do, we indeed come to grips with the greatness of God and the seriousness of God about sin in the world and the way that he's going to take care of this in the final days. Now, as we come into Revelation, we have said many times that we want to be careful between uh, speculation and revelation. We want to lean on revelation, what God has clearly said. And Revelation is one of those books that people have a lot of speculation about. I remember growing up as a kid, uh, I remember hearing that the beast is Russia. It's got to be Russia. You know, the wall was still up in Berlin. The Cold War was there. The Soviet Union was bad. Uh, you know, just uh, the, the, the people that we feared the most as Americans and hated the most as Americans. And we just knew that there was going to be a nuclear war that was started by the Russians because the Russians are the beast, the Antichrist. Well, as time went on and the, uh, Russia, the Soviet empire fell, the EU rose. Now, I'm older than the EU. I'm older than Google. And I remember when the EU came about and there were people who began to say, no, no, the EU is the Antichrist. And so there's a lot of different speculation about who the Antichrist is and all the different aspects of the book of Revelation. If you're familiar with the, the idea of uh, conspiracy theory and tinfoil hats, you know, this goes back uh, to when people had the, the, the ideas about aliens reading your mind and you'd wear a tinfoil hat to keep the aliens uh, or the government from reading your thoughts. And, and so normally it's just a piece of foil that's shaped around your head and usually comes to a point. Now, we're in Italy, and Italy requires bella figura, uh, the beautiful image. And so we can't just ha simply have a tinfoil hat with a little point. We need something a little bit more stylish. So I have brought with me my tinfoil hat <laughs> today. So when I bring out the Italian tinfoil hat and put that on, you're going to know that this is Randy's speculation and not necessarily the revelation, uh, but I do want to help to fill in some of the gaps there. But understand, don't take that to the bank. So if you've got your copy of God's Word, open with me to Revelation 6 and grab your note sheet. You'll want to follow along. As we get to this part of Revelation 6, we see this expression at the end, the wrath of the Lamb has come. This is where we're getting into that really heavy part where we see God really beginning to pour out on an unbelieving, ungodly world his wrath that is rightly deserved. So uh, let's get quick, a quick summary of what we've seen so far in Revelation 6 and where we are. The first thing that we see is when we open uh, the first uh, seals is the four horsemen. By the way, uh, Revelation 6 to me is kind of a broad overview of Daniel's 70th week. If you're not familiar with that term, uh, but you've heard uh, the seven years of tribulation, this is the, the same kind of thing there. Basically, it's the last seven years of this age of planet Earth before the millennial kingdom is set up. So this is an important week or, of years in the, what the Bible calls the end of the age. Uh, so as we look at this, what we've seen in Revelation 6 is just kind of a big overview of that. And so as we uh, opened the first four seals, we saw the four horsemen of the apocalypse revealed. And we saw kind of the parallel to Matthew 24 and what he calls the beginning of the birth pains there. Secondly, we saw the fifth seal open. We saw the martyrs under the throne. And we saw the, the close parallels to how Jesus describes uh, the, the great tribulation. And then today, what we're getting into is the day of the Lord. So the whole seven years is not the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord really seems to come at the end of that seven years. And that's the passage that we're looking at in the sixth and seventh seals. Now, I have a little bit of an, of an allergy to charts and, and things like that. So understand this is a little bit of a hes hesitation to present this. But just to kind of give you a visual, and I apologize if this is a little bit small, kind of what we see is that that seven-year period is broken in two in the book of Daniel. And in the book of Daniel, we see that the Antichrist comes on the scene. He signs a covenant of peace with the people. And so there's this period of seeming peace in the world. Uh, in Revelation 13, we'll see that the, the beast comes out of a time of incredible chaos. And it's a time when people are looking for a Messiah, and the beast begins to kind of fulfill that for them. It satisfies that. So during that first half, I think, and again, this is thus thinketh the Randy, not thus saith the Lord, is that this is the period of time when the four horsemen come on the scene, where God is turning up the heat on humanity. Then the beast has a significant change. 
He breaks that covenant and the great tribulation begins. Now, I don't think it, it matters what camp you come from as far as how you interpret scripture. This is a pretty agreed upon sort of thing that Antichrist breaks that covenant. The great tribulation begins. The question is, who's in the tribulation at that point? And as you heard last week in the sermon, I think that's believers. Um, and so go back and listen to that if you, if you haven't yet. Then, I think at the end of that is when we hit the six and seven seals. Now, again, this is an approximation. Don't take this as, oh, I can figure out exactly what year and day and all that 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 starts. This is just kind of an approximation of the sequence. Underneath that, you see the fifth seal. This is the martyrs. And then I think, again, that this is martyrs of all the ages. But certainly in that seven-year period, we see an uptick of the number of people that are being killed for the name of Christ, particularly during the Great Tribulation period. So uh, that's kind of the big picture, big overview. And here's just a couple of things that I would say. Number uh, that seals six and seven seem to be a summarized perspective of the rest of the book of Revelation. He is really condensing down what we're going to see in greater detail as we go. What we see is that the seven trumpets and the seven bowls are later going to fill in the details between seals six and seven. That's just kind of the the me perspective and several others that, that look at uh, the book of Revelation. So let's get into the content of what we do. By the way, just kind of an interpretive clue uh, for the book of Revelation, not everything is written in a strictly chronological order. So you don't start at chapter 6 and then look at a day-by-day -day progression or week-by-week -week or month-by-month. -month. It's actually going to jump around a little bit. And here's just one quick example. In chapter 11, you have the two witnesses that are boldly proclaiming the good news. They are speaking the truth. They're performing great signs and wonders. These are good guys. These are representatives of the Lord. And it says, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that arises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. Now notice, this is chapter 11. We've not really had much mention of the beast beforehand, uh, before then. And it's not until chapter 13 that we really see the appearance of the beast. So Revelation isn't written in a strictly chronological order. It's not until two chapters later that the beast arises and comes on the scene, at least as the way the book of Revelation is written. So there's some thematic elements that are not necessarily meant to be taken as this happens and this happens and this happens. It's more the order of the visions as John receives them and the theological themes that they follow, not so much a day-by-day -day sequence, if that makes sense to you. Okay, we'll come back to that later. All right, so let's talk about the sixth seal. This is where we pick up in Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 through 17 that you heard earlier. And this is the final warning of God's wrath. This is where God is, in very clear ways, making the world to know, I'm very serious, the world is coming to an end, judgment is coming, you need to turn to me before it's too late. And so we see uh, the sixth seal is opened, and, and, and this seems to be the events that immediately precede the return of Christ. Again, going back to Matthew 24, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall down from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken, then will appear in heaven, the sign of the Son of Man, the sign of the coming of the Son of Man. So if you look at verse 12 in chapter 6, it says, When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by the wind. So identical parallels here. And the way that Jesus lays this out in Matthew 24 is that these events are happening right after the Great Tribulation and right before his coming. So I think that what we're seeing here in Seal 6 are the events that are spoken of in Matthew 24 that immediately precede the coming of Jesus. And here are the things that we see in this. So here's where I need to put this on. So clearly, we see geological disasters. If you're British, geologic if you're American. Geologic disasters devastating earthquakes. And, and, and here's where the, 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 the tinfoil hat comes in. I think this might be pointing to such great earthquakes that it triggers volcanic eruptions or the volcanic eruptions are the cause of the great earthquakes. And the reason why I say that is that 
when there was the great earthquake, the sun becomes black as sackcloth and the moon becomes like blood. So we know that there's incredible earthquakes, incredible shakings that are going on. These disasters are global in nature. It says in verse 14, every mountain and island was moved from its place. These are huge earthquakes and they are global in the scope. We're not talking about just something that's happening in in Israel. We're not talking about something that's just happening in the Middle East. We're talking about something that is global in the nature. Worldwide, this will be happening. The second is that the disasters are catastrophic, that they were moved out of their place. Now, there's been a series of disaster movies, and you'll see some of the images from some of these that kind of capture, at least from the human perspective, of different ways the world could end. Uh, I remember having a conversation with my nephew one time. He was young, only about 11 or 12 years old, and he says, I know of at least five different ways that the world would come to an end. I said, did you know that the Bible tells us how the world is going to come to an end? And it is certainly some of these things that are hinted at in some of the movies. This is from the movie 2012. If you remember, uh, the, the Mayan calendar was supposed to have come to an end. If you're old enough to remember, there were actually people who were really concerned that the world would come to an end on the winter solstice of the year 2012. And so this movie was made about six years before that. And as you can see, the, the scene there, this is Los Angeles finally falling into the ocean. Um, I mean, they've been talking about this for years. Uh, and then and, and, and there's that scene, you know, that it's sliding into the ocean, the incredible upheaval. And that just kind of gives you an idea of what the Bible is maybe alluding to in this. This is not some 6.0, you know, shake you, make you a little bit concerned. This is getting closer to that 10.0. 9.5 is the biggest earthquake ever recorded, and that was in Chile uh, about three or four decades ago, uh, maybe a little bit more than that. But that was a huge one. And out of that, it was so big. I mean, this could be felt in a, in a lot of different places, but there was a volcano that erupted as a result of that, and it created this huge ash cloud. I remember as a kid, I was probably about 12 or 13, uh, my dad uh, was driving us from family vacation. We were heading back home, driving across Tennessee, and he missed uh, the fork in the road of the interstate. Um, uh, Paul, is, uh, Hannah, uh, you know this spot, uh, just around Knoxville, you have I-40 that goes one direction, and then the other one that, I think it's 65 or whatever, not 65, but another interstate that heads down uh, toward Alabama. We wound up on the wrong road, and we came across this cave called the Lost Sea, and that turned out to be the coolest part of the whole vacation. We took a tour of the cave, and down at the bottom of the cave was this lake with fish that were pale, they were almost transparent, and they were blind, you know, living in this cave. But I remember going on that glass bottom boat tour at the bottom of the cave, the lady saying that the earthquake that happened in the 1960s, a 9.0, changed the water level of the lake in that cave in Tennessee. Earth shaking on a 9.0, we're talking about something that may be even bigger. Secondly, it's not only the ground that is shaking, but it is the cosmos that is shaking. We see the cosmic disasters, the sun, the moon, uh, this, and and the, sky, the stars in the sky, verses 13 and 14, the sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell uh, to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up. And so we see these unusual long-duration eclipses. And I use that in the broad term of an eclipse, not necessarily in the technical term, like we'll see on April 8th in the U.S. where the, full, where the new moon uh, moves in front of the sun and the sun is darkened. Uh, that's an incredible event, but that only lasts about four minutes if you're in the right spot. This is long duration kind of stuff. And, and so what I'm thinking is that this is more similar to 536 A.D., now, if you're not familiar with this, during the pandemic, everyone was saying this is the worst year to be alive. And so some Harvard guys got together and like, huh, what would actually be the worst year to have been alive on planet Earth? And they settled on the year 536. And the reason why they did is because Procopius and a couple of other historians record this event. This is during the Byzantine Empire. Justinian is the emperor of the day. 
Procopius is an attorney, a historian, and he's traveling with one of the generals, Belisarius. And he writes, and it came about during this year, 536, that the most dread, uh, uh, most dread portent took place. For the, same, uh, for the sun gave forth its light without brightness, like the moon, during this whole year. And it seemed exceeding like the sun in eclipse. For its beams, it, uh, for the beams it shed were not clear, nor such as it was accustomed to shed. And from the time when this thing happened, men were free neither from war, nor pestilence, nor any other thing leading to death. And it was the time when Justinian was in the 10th year of his reign. So this was an incredible year. Here's some of the things that happened. It was the coldest, it set off the coldest decade in recorded history. And by the way, you see the tree rings? Part of the reason why we have this confirmation of this dating is from tree ring studies. The other reason is ice core samples from Antarctica and the Swiss Alps, where they have seen uh, the, the, the markings from that time period of a volcanic eruption that seemed to have covered the world with an ash cloud. We had, because of the cold, Snow in the summertime in places like China. We had a multi-year crop failure. If you're not a farmer, crops like warm, not cold. They don't like winter in the middle of summer. And so because of that, there was malnutrition and starvation. Rats and pests were also seeking food and warmth. That got them closer to humans. Where is it warm? Where is their food? Where the humans are. And so rats began to infest homes and climb into the beds with people and things like that. And so Justinian's plague came about four years later in the year 540, which was the bubonic plague. And it killed an estimated 35 to 55% of everyone in Europe and Asia. Because of this, there was a massive migration of people and ensuing conflicts. Remember, Procopius said that during that time, there was just such war going on, conflict that was going on, because people were trying to find a place where we can raise food and find food and feed ourselves. And there was mass migration going along. And that, my friends, is when the Dark Ages began. So if you've ever gone and seen the Pantheon in Rome and saw that that was built in 125 with that massive unsupported uh, dome and why it took until the year 1500 before the new dome based on that dome was built in Florence, the first of its type, in 1,500 years? It's because of this. This was a society-killing event. Engineering skills were lost. Uh, so many other skills that it took for architecture and all the things that we see the Romans do that build those lasting things. Why did they disappear? because we had one year where there was an ash cloud, presumably from a volcanic eruption or from an asteroid or something hitting the earth. We're not entirely sure what that event was, but that was a one year event and look what it did. This created such a long period of societal collapse that we call the dark ages now. So what is that gonna be like? Bad stuff. Secondly, we see the stars falling. Um, now, this could be speaking of like meteorites or space debris or even comets or asteroids or something else. I don't know. This is clearly why I'm wearing the hat because it, we're not told exactly. We just know that uh, we see this here. And also, this is kind of the fulfillment of what Isaiah says in I Isaiah 34, 4. All of the host of heaven shall rot away and the skies roll up like a scroll. All their host shall fall as leaves fall from the vine, like leaves falling from the fig tree. This language sounds familiar, doesn't it? This is what Isaiah predicted about 700 years before Christ. This is what John's saying, this is what's going to happen then. It'll be a terrible time when we have lots of things striking and impacting the earth. Third, we see the sky rolled up. This is from Haggai 2.6. It says, and also it's quoted in uh, Hebrews 12, 26. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised. Yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, things that have been made 
in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. It's the beginning of the end, the beginning of the removal of the old earth so that the new heaven and the new earth can come on the scene. It'll be a devastating time to the human population. And this is God's warning to humanity. Turn while you can. I'm here. I am God. I am holy. I am serious. But here's a reminder. Don't get so caught up in the speculation that you miss the revelation. The natural disasters are theogenic, not anthropogenic. They're not man-made. The, the things that you hear Greta and, and so many of these in the climate context talking about, uh, they, they treat climate change as though it's a man-made anthropogenic event. And so therefore we can tax it and make it go away mysteriously. <laughs> it's always worked. Um, but what we see is that what we're talking about here is clearly theogenic events. While Greta, if she's alive in that day, may be saying, told you, God's saying, I warned you, and I am warning you. And so these are theogenic, God-made natural disasters. They have a supernatural cause. And this gets us to the terrifying wrath of the lamb. Notice that word lamb is underlined. Listen to the words here in 15 and following. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone slave and free hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains and calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. Folks, if you think that Jesus is just cuddly and sweet and that he doesn't get angry? Scripture says something very different. And we need to be very careful that we don't build an idolatrous view of Jesus, but that, again, we receive Jesus as he is revealed, not as we want him to be. During the Super Bowl, there was an ad, thank you, John, for reminding me of this, called He Gets Us. And it was a very controversial ad, and most of them are. I don't like them at all. They seem to have a very idolatrous view of Jesus, quite frankly. And it also has a, a faulty assumption. The problem isn't that he doesn't get us. It's that we don't get him. And that's the problem. We don't get who he really is. We don't get that he is holy. We don't get that all the sin that we are doing is storing up wrath for planet Earth. And the only reason why he doesn't squash us like a bug in the moment like we deserve is grace. Romans says, don't you realize that his patience is leading you to repentance? The reason why he waits, the reason why he holds out is to give you time to realize he is who he says he is. He is holy and he is serious about sin and he cannot tolerate sin and his wrath is heating up all the more because planet Earth is turning away from him. And We need to realize that that patience has an end, and this is what Revelation is pointing us to. This is not an infinite time frame of patience, that there's coming a day when that patience will end and wrath will be unleashed on planet Earth, and that's what we're getting a glimpse of here. And so, when all these people see what's going on and they realize that what's happening, they're trying to hide, they're, they're, they're even crying out, for the mountains to fall on them. This is how desperate they are to get away from God's wrath. And they said, for their, the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? This is the question that is asked in that day, and it should be asked of any of us who have any kind of sense to read and understand that God is absolutely serious, that you are not strong enough or big enough to withstand God and his wrath. 
if you've ever seen the old classic movie, Forrest Gump, Sal, thank you, I'm glad you're here. I know you've seen it, and, and, and you're my go-to. But if you've ever seen that, there's that moment where Lieutenant Dan is angry at God for losing his legs, and they're out on Forrest, uh, his, his shrimp boat, and during the hurricane that comes, Lieutenant Dan is up shaking his fist at God and angry at God. And it seems that he is just doing battle and waging war with God. And what a moment it is for Lieutenant Dan. But in this day that we're talking about here, Lieutenant Dan will not stand, nor will any of us. So let's look a little more. Luke chapter 21 also describes this moment. It says, and there will be signs in the sun and moon and the stars and on the earth, distress of nations and perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. What tends to follow major earthquakes that are coastal or big enough? Tsunamis. And this is one of the byproducts that we see, and this is big enough, and, and often enough, and frequent enough, that the cities may be destroyed or ruined or wiped off the face of the earth, and people are, are quaking at this. Because these are not like the tsunamis, even in the early 2000s, when we saw a quarter of a million people die in an instant when that tsunami hit Indonesia. And that was tragic, but this will be even more terrifying than that. People were fainting with fear and foreboding of what is coming on the world where the powers of the heavens will, will be shaken. Not maybe, will be. And here's some things that we see in this. No one will be able to escape. Verse 15, then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and powerful and everyone, slaves and free, hid themselves. We see seven classes of people are listed here. Remember, seven is the number of completeness. So, er one, everywhere. Everyone. Everyone is affected by this. Five of these seven are the rich and powerful. Here is the thing we need to hear in this. Money and power will not save you. There is still a list from a man who did not kill himself that is yet to be disclosed. Now that's going to sink in in just a second. I don't want our YouTube video to get censored and, and taken off. Why has that not been released? I think that speaks to the the names that are on that list. Because we know the level of human trafficking that went on, the injustice that has been done, the immorality, the sin, the heinousness of this act, and yet the rich and powerful are sheltering themselves, shielding themselves from this. But in that moment, in that day, there will be no shield and no shelter, not even for any of these or any who are alive at that moment. So, if in the random chance that you, Bill Gates, or Elon, or whoever is watching, turn to Christ, brother. You need him. There will be nowhere to escape. Verse 16, they hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks and of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne. Why are they calling out to that? Because there's nowhere else to go. There's nowhere safe on the surface of the planet. The seas are not safe. The air is not safe. And so they're climbing into the holes. And this is even a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 2, verses 10 through 21. Read it when you get a chance. Not now. Pay attention now. <laughs> Number three. And here's what's clear. No one will be able to withstand his wrath. No one is going to come out on the other side saying, yep, I beat God. He gave me my best. I, Lieutenant Dan, on the top of the mast, and I came out on the other side, yay me. Nobody. Let me go back to this idea. No one will be able to escape. Speaking of disaster movies, 1998, uh, we were concerned because two movies came out in the same year about an asteroid hitting Earth. One was Deep Impact, the other was Armageddon. Armageddon was a little more uh, entertaining. Deep Impact was a little more impactful. In Deep Impact, both of them send a spaceship to go blow the asteroid up. 
in deep impact. Does anybody remember what the name of that shuttle is? Messiah. Humanity was facing complete and total destruction. And humanity went to technology to save them. Folks, on this day, technology will not save us from the wrath of God. Technology will not be our Messiah. In the movie uh, 2012, you see the ship uh, that is built there. Uh, they actually call that an ark. The world leaders had gotten kind of the heads up from some scientists who were predicting this is indeed the end. The core of the earth was heating up because of the activity of the sun. And so they sold seats on the ark to the rich for 1 billion euros per seat. And so only the rich and, of course, only the political leaders were going to be on the ark. And we see that for deep impact, they had built a cave system that was going to be the rich and the powerful. And, oh, and at least in this one, we had a lottery for the rest of us that maybe you could get lucky and find your way into safety underground. But no one, no one will be able to escape the wrath. There will be no technology. There will be no rich and powerful. Everyone is laid bare before him. Folks, here is what is clear in Scripture. The only way to avoid the wrath of the Lamb then is to receive the grace of the Lamb now. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the day of grace. If you're thinking you can wait and figure things out, then it will be too late. The arrogance that we have as humanity is the worst will not happen to me. No one in the Twin Towers got up that day thinking, I'm going to die today. No one who died in the Titanic thought, I'll be one of the ones who goes under. Every one of us thinks that if we're in some kind of disaster, we will be the survivor, but somebody's got to die in, the, in the, the disaster, and that may be you, and it may be suddenly, and it may not even wait until the disaster turn to Christ while you can. This is the revelation that we have here, that time is ticking down, and this is not a game we can play with God. And we will, may not have the faculty and the time in that moment to do what needs to be done. If you don't know for sure that you would go to heaven if you were to die today, we need to talk today. Grab me after the service and say, I'm not sure. Or I know for sure. Because some that are in here or watching may realize that already. And folks, what we're seeing in the sixth seal this is only the beginning of the terror to fall. This is not the end. These are the signs that the end is coming. As horrible and terrible as they are, this is the final warning. The end is later coming, and that's going to be even worse. And I, I say that because in that statement, their wrath has come. It can be taken a couple of ways. One is we're realizing that we are in that day of wrath right now. But there are a lot of Greek scholars who will look at that and say, hold on a second. That may very well be an ingressive heiress. That's Greek terminology. You don't need to know that. But what it points to, what that stresses, is the beginning or the entrance into the state. That they're looking, and the next thing that happens is God's wrath has come. The wrath of the Lamb is coming next. That's what that may be communicating here. And so the tr seven trumpets and the seven bowls are going to fill in the gap between the ingress of wrath and the completion of the seventh seal. So there's a lot that's about to come. We'll talk about the seven seals and so forth after Resurrection Sunday. So here's what we see happening in seal six. God is now causing deep distress on the unbelieving world that has distressed his children, believers. Christ followers as a final warning to humanity. Six is following, uh, uh, seal six is following seal five in a very sequential way where we're seeing the guilt of the world and martyring his people, hating God enough that they're doing that, and now we're seeing God answering their prayer, the beginning of that. We see that more fully. Whew. 
between, as, as you notice in the reading, seal six ends at the end of chapter six. But then Mark jumped over to chapter eight. There's an interlude there that we'll talk about next week, and it's a very important interlude. There's a, a gap that happens between the sixth and the seventh. But we're going to talk about the seventh seal today, and we'll get to the gap next week. And that's the first five verses of chapter eight. When the seventh seal is open, the, uh, we see three key events that come at the breaking of the seventh seal. The first is a half-hour holy hush in heaven. Uh, Pastor Sam, I did that alliteration for you, brother. But there's a silence in heaven for about half an hour. And Zephaniah 1.7 says, Be silent before the Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. What's about to happen in seal 7 is so huge, so big, that the ongoing chorus of worship and praise, the loud and thunderous worship comes to a collective halt as everyone holds their breath in anticipation of what's coming next. If you've ever been in a moment where you know what's coming and you're anticipating what's coming, that sometimes the only thing you can do is just <gasps> and wait because it's so big. Now, sometimes that's an excited sort of waiting in silence, and sometimes it's such an awe, terror-filled kind of thing that you're still pulled back. You know what's going to happen. You can't stop it. And I think in heaven, they know what is about to happen. They know what is coming. And there's a holy expectation about what's about to happen next. And for an entire half hour in heaven, no one can say anything. Because it's about to get real. That every hope and desire of everyone on planet Earth who follows and knows the Lamb is about to finally come to full completion. That what God had started in the beginning, what he had intended in the Garden of Eden, but was so quickly lost, is now finally about to be brought on the scene, but not before God sweeps the slate clean of all sin and all the ungodly. And so the second thing that we see is that Seven trumpets are given to the seven angels who stand before God. We don't know who these angels are. It doesn't really matter. We just know that they're going to be initiating the wrath that comes from these trumpets, the judgments that are about to follow, the plagues as they're called. And we see that in verse 2. And then third, here's an incredible thing. What's going to set all of those seven trumpets into motion is our prayer our weaponized prayer will set God's judgments in motion. Listen to verses 3 through 5. Another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to altar with the prayers of all the saints. Remember, that's every Christian. On the golden offer before the throne and the smoke of the incense with the prayer of the saints rose before God from his hand, from the hand of the angel. So we have this representation of an angel going over to this place that kind of figure, uh, symbolically shows that our prayers are, like we saw early on in uh, Revelation chapter 4, are being heard and held before God. The 24 elders have bowls of our prayers. It's a a picture of our prayers are constantly being held before the Lord in the closest proximity that he doesn't just hear and forget, but they are held until the right time, the right moment for them to be answered. And if you've ever felt like your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling and not being heard, look closely at this. Because now... We have this angel going over, and he's given this incense, and it's representing the prayers, and prayers are there, and they're rising up before the Lord. We're seeing now these prayers of the martyrs that are again rising up of the, how long, O oh Lord, until you vindicate us, until your vengeance comes on the earth. In all of those how long, O oh Lords, that we have ever prayed, verse 5, then the angel took the censer, and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder and rumblings and flashes of lightning, 
and an earthquake. All of a sudden, all of our prayers that have seemed so powerless are power-filled. And they are part of what God uses to pour out his wrath on the ungodly people who have so long distressed and tribulated and killed his people. It is a supreme act of vindication. And it is an incredibly beautiful thing that the Lord does to show us that what's about to follow in the seven trumpets is a direct answer to our prayer. So the how long, O sovereign Lord, prayer of the martyrs is now being answered. Look again at at chapter 6, verse 10, then they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? It's finally in that moment where all of those who have escaped justice in this world, who are living in the world in that day, will be brought to justice. All of those who have been complicit with the guy who did not kill himself will be brought to justice. They may escape justice on planet Earth in the human system, but they will not escape justice. The how longs that we may cry out for all the different things that we see wrong in the world, going bad in the world, the evil in the world, now is the moment that they are answered. Brothers and sisters, don't give up on prayer. Don't give up on crying out to a holy God about the unholiness in the world and the injustice in the world. There's coming a day when God makes that right and he does it graciously as an answer to our prayer and he will use those prayers as a weapon against an ungodly world. Fill up the arsenal. Fill it full. May there not be a bomb or missile of prayer that is lacking because we have been lax in prayer. Amen? And so we see that he fills it with fire from the altar and casts it at the earth. Notice that four of the seven trumpets that are about to follow in the rest of chapter 8 and 9 involve fiery judgments. Revelation 8, 7 is just the first one, and we see trumpets number 1, 2, 3, and 5 are the ones that very clearly had this fire mixed in there. It says the first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood, and these were thrown upon the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Folks, 2 Peter 3, verse 7, talks about the scoffers saying, hey, where's the coming of the Lord? And we're reminded that the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. The same one who spoke the universe into existence as the one who destroyed the world by flood, but yet he promised never to destroy it by flood or water again. And verse uh, three, uh, or chapter three, verse seven, the second Peter says, by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. And it's our, the fire of our prayers that ignite that fire on earth. What a humbling, wonderful thing. What does the enemy want to keep you from doing? Praying. What does the enemy want you to think? Your prayers are pointless, they're worthless, they're powerless. Bring it to the enemy in prayer. Because that day is coming. Then, then comes the final outpouring of his wrath. Revelation 8, 5 says that there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Here's an interesting thing. Seal 7, trumpet number 7, and bowl number 7 all meet in the same place. They meet with lightning, thunder, earthquake, and heavy hail. All three of them. Parallel is there, and I think all of these are pointing to the seventh on all of those are the final wrath that God pours out. We're going to talk more about that. The seventh trumpet and the seventh bowl clearly announce this is the end. We see that the seventh bowl reveals an earthquake that is greater than any since man has been on the earth 
with the result that every mountain has been leveled. Chapter 16, verses 18 and 19. It is a world-ending type of event. So the one we see in seal 6 is big, but the one coming in seal 7 and trumpet 7 and bowl 7 are the biggest that has ever been. And the seventh bowl reveals hailstones falling that weigh 45 kilograms, 100 pounds each. Some of you may remember the hailstorms that hit Italy last summer. They were big as my hand with little spikes on it, and they did incredible damage. Broke up homes, tore up cars. We've seen my, my brother-in-law, Sandy's brother, as a a contractor in the Dallas area, and there was a hailstorm that came through several years ago, and there was football-sized hail that went not only through the roof of the houses, but through the second floor and hit the first floor as well. We can't even imagine the kind of devastation that comes with that. But we'll talk more about that fun stuff when we get there. So here's some key takeaways from the sixth and seventh seal. First, is that the day of the Lord will be a terrifying time of God's judgment and wrath on the world. The theogenic climate change is a far greater concern than any anthropogenic issues that we may think are there. The greatest problem on planet Earth is sin, not carbon. CO2 is not the problem. S-I-N is the problem. And it is not because we're polluters that God is going to destroy the world. It's because we pollute the world with sin that he will do that. Second, worldly securities like wealth and power will be worthless on that day. And folks, we're not just talking about the ultra-rich. If we're not careful, we tend to do the same things. We tend to insulate our lives. We set up our 401ks and IRAs and our savings account and our investment accounts and, 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 and we have our home and we, we do the things to try to keep ourselves safe. We buy guns or we get security or do whatever it is that we can to keep ourselves safe. But all of wealth, all of the presumed power, martial arts skills and anything else that we may think will keep us safe are worthless on that day. The only thing that will keep you safe is the grace of the Lamb now. And folks, that day is not speculation. There's no tinfoil hat about that. It's not just simply a disaster movie showing a possible end of the world. The revelation of Jesus is showing us what will happen. It is certain, it is severe, and it will come suddenly. It is foolish to think you can ignore it and arrogant to think you can time it. And folks, by the way, your day of judgment could arrive at any moment. You may be waiting for judgment day to get right, but your judgment day may come today. We're not guaranteed another day of life. Hebrews chapter 12, and I'll, I'll wrap this up here. Starting in verse 25 and following. I've read part of this before. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, in the light of all this, let us, believers, be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and let us, believers, offer to God acceptable Worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. So do you know for sure you're ready? The day is coming. Are you ready? 
Your day may come before then. Are you ready? If it came to today, are you ready? Turn to Jesus. Turn to the Lamb while he is gracious. Kiss the Son, Psalm 2 says, lest he become angry with you. Amen.